Hello and welcome back and I never thought I'd make this comparison. I never thought I'd have to make this particular versus video where I would compare a Synology from 2025 against a QNAP from 2022. Things have gone a bit nuts, right? Right now, if you're moving away from the cloud and you want to take ownership of your data with your own private server, the brand Synology and QNAP are probably the two of the loudest brands being thrown at you. If you run small prosumer operations, you know, a little SMB operation there, maybe you're just a home user that just wants to have a reasonably powerful private server and you want it turnkey with no fuss and no silicon paste under the fingernails. Well, both of these devices do give you a great deal, both with Synology and DSM and QNAP and QTS and QUTS, more on that later. Both of these devices do have a lot on offer. They both ride mobile application, desktop application, surveillance application, virtual machine applications, a myriad of backup tools, file management, photo uh, management, video management, installation of third party services. Both of them allowing you to deploy completely fully within a local area network or arrange remote access via their own relay services, as well as using the likes of Talscale and more. Both of them support Plex Media Server. Both of them allow you to access them anywhere in the world securely with two-factor authentication, SSL certificates, VPNs, and more. Both arrive with three years of manufacturer's warranty. So you can extend to five years if you want. Hell, they both arrive at a pretty similar price point of between five to 600 Nikka, despite the fact there is over three years difference between them in terms of hardware release. There was a time when this brand would release hardware every year, but they have slowed things down because a lot of people criticized QNAP for concentrating way too far on their hardware and not on the software. And hopefully this is them listening because this device is still available in the market since 2022 and sales apparently are still very, very consistent for it. Now, QNAP have continued to work within this hardware and done quite a lot. One of the most impressive things being with the software that we'll talk about later on. But I think for a lot of you out there, it's going to be about the capabilities. And there are a few things about these two that we've got to talk about. Number one, this device here runs on an AMD embedded Ryzen platform. It runs with the V1500B, a quad-core, eight-thread processor from AMD with a long a time of support all the way up to 2029 20, I believe in terms of software support services and more for that platform it also arrives with four gig of memory it's ECC memory at that and it can be scaled up to 32 gig when needed now the QNAP on the other hand runs with an Intel Celeron processor the N5105 this is a CPU that arrived in 2021 2022 and it is showing its age slightly so much so that Intel have actually abandoned the Celeron name and convention in favor of the Alder Lake and then eventually the Twin Lake processors, neither of which are available currently, at least at the time of recording, on the QNAP platform. That CPU, on the other hand, is a quad-core four-thread processor, and it has integrated graphics on board, which a lot of users do see the benefits in when it comes to uh, integrated graphics operations, such as Plex Transcoding, uh, or if you're going to be running particularly detailed virtual machine environments there, and containerization as well. But it's things like the memory, where, uh, depending on the model you get, you either get the model that arrives with four gig of memory that can be upgraded on uh, over two slots up to 16 gig maximum, or you can get the one that arrives with eight gig by default, but it's fixed eight gig that can't be upgraded. That was largely caused due to memory shortages um, about 18 months ago, and that ended up uh, kind of causing a lot of NAS manufacturers to change some of the policies on the memory on their systems with pre-soldered memory rather than removable sodium. So there are two different versions of this knocking around. You can generally tell by the naming convention with the Dash 4G being the expandable one and the Dash 8G being the fixed 8 gig memory model. Bottom line, if you are looking at running virtual machines and containers, this one is probably going to be more desirable to you because of those additional threads allowing you to create eight virtual CPUs, or if you're going to be running containers, have a better means to chop up the available range of uh, CPU resources across your different ops. On top of that, ECC memory is going to ensure that when data is passing through the system, it has an extra layer of integrity checks, which for higher scale, higher volume, higher frequency data operations is going to be tremendously desirable there. The kind of memory policy caused by those shortages a year, year and a half ago, really have muddled the water a little bit about when people try to purchase the QNAP NAS. It also leads to very inconsistent pricing because a lot of places don't use the full model title. So a lot of the time you might be thinking, oh, that seems overly expensive. It's because it's the model with more memory by default. Bottom line, this is great for multimedia operations and I think is a CPU, I think, for just general multimedia use, maybe AI operations as well, some of which are baked into some of the QNAP ops are going to be good for you. But overall, in terms of file processing and performance, the Synology takes this round.
Ports and connectivity is of course the next subject I wish to discuss because both of these brands actually have very different attitudes to that, especially in the DS925 Plus. Now the DS925 Plus is, one of, is the first Synology NAS to arrive with 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports. Finally. Uh, now, I say finally because everyone, including QNAP, have been rocking those out since about 2020. And in 2025, better late than never, right? So this system has two times 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports there, and that's it. You can't add any more with USB upgrades. You can't add any more with a PCIe upgrade. That was the DS923 Plus that came out two, two and a half years before. Those 2.5, 2 times 2.5 GBE ports are it. And the USB ports on this are severely limited. They are only really utilized for UPSs. There aren't that many peripherals that still support them. Although the newer generation device does allow a USB Type-C expansion device to be connected, the DX525. Now the QNAP, remember, this thing came out in 2022. The reason that's relevant is this device arrives not only with 2 times 2.5 GBE ports anyway, so it's already matched that. It also arrives with the support of numerous USB expansions. So this allows you to add one 5 bay expansion. QNAP have got a 2 bay USB expansion, a 4 bay USB expansion, an 8 bay USB expansion device. It has different ones that have got hardware RAID and JBOD. This only has a JBOD one. That means the RAID is managed by the system. But on top of that, this has... 10 gig USB port. So this expansion would be connected via a five, oh, sorry, a six gigabits per second connection, capping performance at 600 megs, or again, 660, something like that, 670. This on the other hand has ports that will allow you up to 1000 megabytes per second or one gigabyte per second USB connection. Also those USBs support a myriad of different accessories, including network upgrades that allow you to add 2.5 and five gig connections, even more, more network connectivity. There's an HDMI output with an HDMI um, parallel interface that you can use with a remote control or a keyboard and video mouse. It is a little dated these days, I will say, but there's also a PCIe upgrade slot to add even more upgrades, network upgrades, USB upgrades, Wi-Fi upgrades, SSD upgrades. So despite this being a much older generation device, the TS-464, even in 2025, is a much more hardware-rich system in terms of network connectivity and just general connectivity overall. Likewise, both systems arrive with the ability to add M.2 NVMe slots. The Synology has it on the base, the QNAP has it on the inside bay here. Difference being, on the Synology DS925 Plus, compatibility has been streamlined significantly. We'll talk about that more in a moment, but the result is you can only use Synology SSDs in this system, which at the time of recording are pretty lackluster. The Synology SNV series are based on durability, not performance. And they're priced quite weirdly as well with very few capacities by comparison to any other brand out there. Now that might change over time. So not only you're pursuing a very aggressive uh, kind of uh, compatibility and support list for storage media on this system. So for example, when it comes to the main storage base, you're gonna need to use Synology's own hard drives right now. When this device rolled out, the only drives listed on the compatibility pages are their own uh, HAT3300, HAT5300, and the SAT5200 SSDs. Why is that a problem? They don't cover all of the capacities. Also, some of the availability isn't as good in some regions over than others, but ultimately it's because a lot of users want to buy the biggest, latest drives, things like this, the Seagate iWolf 24TB drive. Now, if you put this in this, at the time of recording, this won't even let you initialize. If you boot the system with these drives inside, it just won't work. This drive worked on the DS923. It worked on pretty much any Synology now as I've ever put it in. But in this system, it won't let me use it if it's not on the official compatibility list and not the official supported Synology drive list. Again, that may change, but it is a weirdly aggressive stance, and that extends, by the way, again, to those SSD bays, because if you use SSDs that aren't on the compatibility list, you can't use them for caching, you can't use them for storage pools, and that's gonna be a big, bitter pill to swallow for some users. Now, you put that against the QNAP, the QNAP supports 24 TBs, it supports third-party SSDs. If I wanna go ahead and fill this system with four 24 TB drives and I wanted to use Crucial or Kingston M.2 NVMEs and use some storage pools, I can. They're on the compatibility list, there is no limitation for that. It's a policy that has certainly 
caused a lot of argument online on the Synology side. And again, at the time of recording, it still looks like there is only Synology drives available to be used on this. Synology say they will add other drives over time as they become certified. But I still don't quite understand why they changed the policy that existed on devices that came before this with exactly the same hardware. Why change it? Finally, onto software. Between these two brands, I'll say right now, it comes no surprise, I've said it before and I'll say it again, DSM is the better software. The Synology software is just smoother. It's more responsive, it has a better UX, it's more consistent. It may feel restrictive at times, but it's definitely between the two of them, the better software platform. QNAP have closed the gap more than ever, and they've innovated on their software a lot more in the last 18 months. But between the two of them, DSM still features Active Backup Suite. It has the better surveillance platform in Surveillance Station, and although only two camera licenses, ultimately the DSM platform still continues to be the gold standard. A lot of users, it actually was enough for them to get over any hesitation they had about storage drive media on the DS925 simply for that software. Synology know that when you buy their systems, you're paying more for the software than the hardware. Indeed, sometimes I question just how much money Synology make from these series of devices at retail. I'm not suggesting they're loss leaders, but I will say that for that platform and how much a good software dev team has and the amount of engagement they have with pwn to own you know, their own security advisories there, how many of the, you know, the bounty programs, uh, the PSI, uh, PSIRT, they run with their QNAP have a number of these, but nowhere near to the same level or for the length of time they have. This isn't me defending the brand and saying, oh, you should buy their system purely based on that, but we have to at least acknowledge in terms of software, the Synology DSM platform is still pretty much the go-to. Now, that isn't to be too mean to the QNAP. Realistically, not only on their software is it much more customizable and more flexible to you, not just those hard drives or SSDs, by the way, their software allows you to use a lot more third-party platforms, everything from hybrid um, mount allowing you to use third-party uh, cloud services, the MARS uh, platform there, it allows you to integrate with WordPress uh, databases. On top of that, some uh, Microsoft OneDrive, rather than using their own proprietary um, Office application, it actually integrates with Microsoft's own Box Safe, um, Hybrid Backup Sync 3, uh, Virtualization Station, the Container Manager, uh, Ubuntu, uh, just so many things on here. It is a great software platform. On top of that, the QNAP side, they've integrated QUTS, the ZFS uh, platform on this system. You are paying five to 600 NICA for a turnkey NAS solution that supports ZFS. You can use RAID Z, you can use inline data duplication, inline data compression, inline data compaction, RAID resilvering when needed. It is a great software platform and arguably is more feature rich than that of the Synology side. Bottom line, the software on the Synology side is probably going to win you over most of all if you're a new user to the world of NAS. But if you like configuring and customization and having a very unique setup, you may see value in QUTS and QTS there on the QNAP side. Bottom line, I still think it's amazing that I can sit here with two NASs that were released over three years apart and the old one with the spectacles and the walking stick over here still holds its own bloody well. The DS925 Plus is a good NAS system. Of what you're paying, you're actually getting a reasonable system here. Although it does lack the network upgradability and slight restrictions on, you know, frankly, insane policies on third-party hard drive support out the gate on this, at least at the time of recording to me, I find baffling and weird. And I think those are reasons that a lot of users who may have gone for this, gen this device at this generation have started looking at QNAP, but if they're not going to buy the DS464, they want to see what this brand is going to roll out after this. QNAP have been very clear. They've been doubling down more on their software and services and companion devices like switches more than they have their NAS series because people have accused them of thinking too much about the hardware. Also, let's be realistic, ransomware like Deadbolt, QSnatch and more certainly gave the brand a kick up the arse when it comes to where their priorities need to be in their business. Have they learned from it? I hope so. But bottom line right now, between these two, it really does come down to flexibility. It comes down to customization and unique kind of deployments versus stable, smooth, and understandable software that is going to be user-friendly. Software versus hardware. It's sad that that is still the case, but it still remains true. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. There are links in the description to not only a comparison guide for both of these devices, but also links to get a hold of these from a few different retailers. If 
you found this video helpful. And if you were gonna go to those shops anyway, use those links, please, because it will result in a small commission coming to here, to me and Eddie at NAS Compares, and it really helps us do what we do. But only do it if those two things are true. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.